Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 543 for the 17th of March 2019. Richard Saunders here with you once again, coming to you from the Bay Area, San Francisco. And thank you so much to the uh, Bay Area skeptics. The other night I gave a talk in Berkeley about uh, psychic detectives, so-called psychic detectives, and Australian crimes, famous Australian crimes, uh, missing children, grisly murders, that sort of thing. And it, uh, I think it went over very well. The crowd seemed to enjoy it, and there were lots of questions afterwards. And as these things turn out, my talk was in the evening, which was fine for me, because I only just arrived in the United States the day before, but my body clock was still on Australian time, which meant that my talk in the evening was roughly about lunchtime in Australia, so I did fine. It's just waking up in the mornings for the next few days is a bit tricky. Now, this is the third time I've given this uh, talk on psychic detectives. I actually gave it for the New South Wales Police Force and members of the uh, Federal Police and Defence Force, which was a great pleasure. And I gave it at Sydney Skeptics in the Pub only a week ago. And it's a fascinating topic, this whole idea of people claiming to be psychics and uh, helping the police. And as I discovered in my research from time to time, some police actually do call in people who claim to have psychic insights and powers. And it's all too easy to condemn police for doing that. It's too quick, I think, to do that, too quick to judge. And part of the problem is, as I see it, police in general don't have the same background and, uh, dare I say, training as uh, skeptics in so much as that uh, many skeptics can understand the psychology of a typical reading what's really going on where something appears to be a psychic insight and turns out later uh, not to be but why it does appear so and again and again when people ask me about this i fall back on a on what i think is a good analogy if you see a magician doing a magic trick right in front of your eyes you can be absolutely mystified at uh, and how that uh, magician could possibly do it, make the rabbit disappear, make the penny appear, appear to read your mind in the case of mentalism. And you could spend the rest of your life not knowing and wondering. But if you learn the trick, if you read the book or the magician discloses the trick to you and you see it again, it's obvious. And, uh, well, the trick's not so exciting anymore, but uh, it's not a trick anymore. And this is the same sort of thing with a psychic reading. Uh, and police officers can uh, fall victim to this too. And they can see a psychic reading in action or get information from a psychic and not realize the psychology. In this case, that represents the trick. But once you know the tricks and the psychology of cold reading, for example, uh, I spent a lot of time transcribing psychic readings. And I've transcribed a police interview with a psychic. And I could then pick that apart and see how the psychic was using, well, basic cold reading techniques. Again, if you don't know how these cold reading techniques work, you can be uh, somewhat amazed. And we'll get the evergreen expression, which is a big red flag to us. They knew things they couldn't have possibly have known. Anyway, thank you again to the Bay Area Skeptics. And I hope to give that talk again. I might even save that up for DragonCon in Atlanta, Georgia, later on in the year, where I'm uh, scheduled to appear and talk. And long-time Skeptic Zone fans might remember that in the very early days of the Skeptic Zone, 2008, 2009, and 2010... Uh, I was at DragonCon and did reports from there. For those of you who don't know, DragonCon is a huge fantasy science fiction festival in Atlanta, Georgia, every year. And it's, when I say huge, it really is huge. It's thousands upon thousands of people turning up in all sorts of weird and wonderful costumes. And there has been a skeptical trek run by my colleague and friend Derek Colanduno. 
and rec- more recently with the assistance of Dr. Angie Matke. Anyway, all that's coming up in the future. But what's coming up in the short-term future on the Skeptic Zone podcast? A bit of a truncated show once again due to my travelling around. Sometimes it's difficult to put a show together when there are a lot of other things going on. And you will notice in this episode my voice seems to change quite a bit. That's because I've been recording in different locations under different circumstances and I was just on the tail end of the flu or the cold or whatever I had. So um, I hope you understand. We're going to be looking at a story concerning celebrity chef Pete Evans, who a few years back won the Bent Spoon Award from Australian Skeptics, and his apparent support for an anti-vaxxer. Pete Evans is an influential man. He has many Facebook followers, So it's very uh, worrying if someone like that is seen to support anti-vaccination. Then Life is Wild with Michelle Franklin, our reporter from Darwin, with a very interesting point of view about what makes you think that your area, your region, your tribe is so special. You've probably seen the meme yourself going around which says, Only in... dot dot dot... Only in Darwin... And it reminds me of quite often in Australia on the TV news, the funny story at the end of the news will be something like, well, only in the United States, dot, 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 and they'll have some sort of crazy story. Michelle looks at some of the thinking behind this only in meme. Then the continuing story of something we've been covering for quite some time, this was the PhD awarded to Julie Wileyman, who is a well-known anti-vaxxer, and recent criticism now of that PhD after it's been studied by other experts. This is the same woman who has been uh, recorded shouting and screaming at vaccination meetings to sort of shout down the doctors talking on stage, and she charges quite a high fee to be an expert witness in court cases too. Then we have an interview by our correspondent in Canberra, Kevin Davies. We quite often run promotions for the Canberra Skeptics and their events. And just the other week, they had a talk about GMO. And this particular talk was titled, Talking Plain About GMOs. We have interviews with Jose Barrero and Martina Tigreros. I'll add a link in the show notes, but their website is gmoonly.com, one word. Then to round off the show, we have a statement, a recently published statement, a restating, a reinforcing of the position of Australian Skeptics, Inc., when it comes to climate change. Now, for too long, we have been accused, and you probably get this yourself, of being a climate change skeptic. Oh, you skeptics, you don't even believe we went to the moon, or oh, you skeptics... You're skeptical about climate change. So the Australian skeptics have put out a strong statement uh, reinforcing the fact that no, that uh, that doesn't mean that the Australian skeptics or skeptical groups or organizations are skeptical of fill in the dots, dot, 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 climate change or people going to the moon or whatever the case may be. Actually, one of the strangest examples I, I ever had of that was Uh, Somebody said to me once, you skeptics, you thought the world was flat. (laughs) What do you say to that? You skeptics, you once thought the world was flat. Yeah, okay. Oh, speaking of that, uh, those of you who have Netflix, if you have not seen the documentary Beyond the Curve, then I can thoroughly recommend it. It is really a fascinating insight into psychology, more than anything else, I think. And it's getting quite a bit of notoriety for the fact that right at the end of the documentary, we have uh, flat earth proponents trying to prove their point of view using science and the amazing results they get. Anyway, I can recommend Beyond the Curve, which is available at the moment on Netflix, and it may be available Uh, on other platforms too stay tuned at the end of the show for more announcements from me but now it's time for me to run upstairs oh yes run upstairs this time 
have me a nice cup of coffee and a bagel. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Now here's a quick note regarding a past Bent Spoon winner. The Australian Skeptics Bent Spoon Award for the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. A few years back this was won by celebrity chef Pete Evans. And as we note, published in the Daily Telegraph by Jane Hansen, celebrity chef Pete Evans supports anti-vaxxer Paul Check on social media. Anti-fluoride, anti-sunscreen, anti-dairy celebrity chef Pete Evans has now revealed his anti-vaccination stripes in a post supporting well-known anti-vaxxer Paul Check who has not vaccinated his own children and supports the widely panned conspiracy movement Vaxxed. Check, a holistic health practitioner, exercise coach and registered Native American spirit guide and medicine man, has claimed, quote, your health is being stolen, end quote, due to vaccinations. Mr. Check endorses the Vaxxed documentary view that immunization causes autism, a link that has been disproved in over 100 large epidemiological studies. Mr. Evans, the My Kitchen Rules star, posted his endorsement of Paul Check's recent podcast with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny to his 1.5 million Facebook followers and 207,000 Instagram followers. So I'm sure there's going to be more about that if that is the case. But an update from one of our uh, Ben Spoon winners, or about one of our Ben Spoon winners, celebrity chef Pete Evans. Hi, I'm Darren McKee, one of the hosts of The Reality Check. Each week, my co-host and I explore a range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. You can find us on iTunes, your favorite podcasting platform, and on Facebook by searching for The Reality Check, or by following us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Until then, keep an open mind, but not so open your brain falls out. Life is wild. With Michelle Franklin. Do you live in a place that's unique? Do you have the best beaches or the funniest traditions? Do you have the coolest origin story or maybe even the most extreme weather? I bet you do. And I know I do. I think most people probably think there's some aspect of their home or their community or their country or their town that's special, that makes them feel either proud or maybe even ashamed. But there's something really unique about their own situation. Picture the memes, a photo of someone doing something particularly stupid or something embarrassing, maybe something hilarious, but always unique and the caption says only in wherever and I bet if you think about it you can come up with a few examples from your own life I'll tell you a couple of mine I live near Darwin our weather is usually either hot and wet or hot and dry and we have cyclones and crocodiles Discounting the fact that we can only survive in a temperature range of about 6 degrees variation and snow would likely kill us, we're pretty proud of our weather and our crocodiles and how they reflect on us as individuals. We tend to think that we're better than the southerners, which is basically a term that means anyone except for us. And I say we because I totally buy into this madness. I feel like the people around me are so much more clever and tough and cool than those other people from over there. But in reality, I know 
I'm no different from anyone else because I bet you could think of a similar list of things that make you and and your group better than everyone else too. And that's okay. We all have something that we hold on to that we think makes us special. Even if it's as simple as living in a town with a funny sounding name and using that to get attention. Not that I would do that. In recent years, I've noticed an increase in the use of the term only in wherever as a meme for various socially agreed upon topics. For me, it's usually only in Darwin or only in Australia. And some photo or other of a crocodile or a snake or a spider or even a derelict looking person in a funny situation that's either surprising or funny. I've seen a few versions of this from other places where other socially relevant situations, sometimes involving politics or local culture or ridiculous hipsters and the amusing clothes that they wear and the crazy things that they eat from, which are most definitely not real bowls. But repeatedly, I see the same recurring theme of only in wherever. Usually I find these memes quite funny and I enjoy seeing crazy situations that other people deal with. But I have a small issue with it. And I guess it comes from knowing my own home well, but being pretty naive of anywhere else. I tend to believe the memes whenever I see them. Why would they lie? Except the ones that are from my town. They're so often wrong. So I can only assume that the ones from other places are likely wrong as well. The one that bothered me most recently was a photo of a large crocodile swimming very close to a small boat and the people in it calmly taking a photo rather than panicking and trying to escape. This image has been shared by my local newspaper, shared by my friends, um, and in all of our local community groups on Facebook with the three famous words, only in Darwin. It's funny and all, and it's good getting attention and scaring your southern relatives, except that there was one minor problem. The animal in the photo was an alligator. So clearly it's not only in Darwin, and it's not even in Darwin. A similar one came up for me a few months back, of a large crocodile swimming along in a marina with a dog in its mouth. This time it was actually a real crocodile, but it was clearly an American crocodile. And again, it says, only in Darwin. And the comments thread was full of Darwin folk, tagging their interstate and international friends saying, see what we live with? Implying, see how cool we are? I even overheard a conversation where people were arguing over which local marina it had been filmed at, and people were convinced it would be on the news tomorrow, not even checking the date to realise that the video has been circulating for quite a while already. There was also one that came to me in an email where the story told of a crocodile in Queensland that had been injured and became tame and was now a friendly pet. This time the story clearly named a specific river in Queensland and described the incident where the crocodile had been injured and this time it said, only in North Queensland. The relative who sent it to me had clearly not read the story closely enough to notice that the crocodile's name was Pocho and the man who befriended him was Gilberto Chito. And it was also clearly an American crocodile. He even has his own Wikipedia page that took me about one second to find on Google. I've been stewing over this for a few weeks and wondering what it all means. And I think I've decided that I need to stop sharing these memes and stop perpetuating the exceptionalism that I feel my town and, by extension, the people around me are worthy of. Because I can see that While it's fun to imply that we're special and unique for our weather and our wildlife, it doesn't take long to realise that most of us don't actually recognise the difference between us and them. We just keep telling ourselves that it's there and we're different and they're other. I think what I've learned from this is that the image that we see as us and the, the image that we see as them are pretty much the same thing. And as much as we tell ourselves that we're so different... If you take down the labels and switch them around, none of us can really tell the difference.
Les habla Paula desde la hermosa ciudad de Buenos Aires en Argentina. Cuando escuchamos podcasts, escuchamos los mismos que escucha todo el mundo, como The Skeptic Zone. Ojalá puedan venir a visitarnos algún día. Los esperamos con nuestras riquísimas comidas locales y hasta podemos ir a bailar un tango. Mientras tanto, sigan disfrutando de su dosis semanal de ciencia y pensamiento racional. ¡Chao! From the website of Australian Skeptics, we read, uh, published on the 5th of March 2019 by Tim Mendham, Review finds Wileyman anti-vax PhD incomplete, biased, and flawed. A recent study by four researchers has raised serious concerns over the notorious PhD thesis written by leading anti-vaxxer Judy Wileyman, which earned her a PhD from the University of Wollongong in 2015. Called, quote, A critical analysis of the Australian government's rationale for its vaccination policy, end quote, Wileyman's thesis describes what she calls, quote, the political framework in which the policy is affected by biased science or undone, underfunded science, end quote, and claims, quote, the existence of institutional barriers to carrying out independent research, including on topics unwelcome to groups with vested interests, end quote. She included collusion between health industry and health authorities, particularly that the World Health Organization, quote, is perceived to be out of touch with global communities and it is controlled by the interests of corporations and the World Bank, end quote. Wileyman is also presenting herself as an expert witness in cases where parents disagree on vaccinating their children. The recent study by three researchers from the Faculty of Medicine and Health at Sydney University, Kerry Wiley, Julie Lisk and Margaret Burgess, and Professor Peter McIntyre, Director of the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, was published this month in the Vaccine Journal. They describe the thesis is based on, quote, incomplete, flawed technical assertions, end quote. Quote, this thesis is notable for its lack of evidence of systematic literature review. Despite its extensive claims, there is no primary research but there is abundant evidence of strong bias in selecting the literature cited and sometimes outright misrepresentation of the facts, end quote. The study authors say that Wileyman's thesis has been downloaded more than 21,000 times, but to date there was no citable peer-reviewed critical appraisal of the methodological rigor of the work. Quote, Our research with non-vaccinating parents suggests that some are considering the thesis in their decision-making and healthcare providers who may be questioned about it by vaccine-hesitant parents have no such resource to aid their discussions, end quote. The thesis journey to final PhD status was not smooth. Based on documents released by the university under a GIPA, Freedom of Information Request, One of two unnamed examiners who reviewed the thesis suggested that it was definitely not worth of achieving PhD status and was more in line with a master's degree level. The examiner expressed, quote, serious concern about the lack of engagement with existing literature and the lack of an appropriate theoretical framework, end quote. They also felt that the thesis showed no evidence that Wileyman conducted original research nor that it demonstrated that she had made, quote, a significant contribution to the knowledge of the subject, end quote. The university then sought a third review, which likewise found problems with the thesis, but after revisions, it was approved for the award. The doctorate was awarded through the Faculty of Law, Humanities and the Arts, i.e. not a scientific or medical faculty. The study authors say that, quote, The quality of writing and presentation of the thesis 
is such that many of its arguments could seem less plausible to an examiner without specific content knowledge, despite sound academic credentials. Our combined expertise, vaccinology, epidemiology, and the history and practice of immunization policy development globally and in Australia, social science, and as PhD examiners, both gives us detailed knowledge of the sources cited by the thesis and allows us to identify key deficiencies, end quote. They go on to say, quote, the thesis is presented as a critical analysis of the Australian government's rationale for its vaccine policy. A critical analysis should consider the merits and faults of an issue and be conducted in a way that is not designed to find only evidence for the writer's predetermined conclusions. Quote, this thesis does not include methods for assessing the literature, does not discuss aspects of identified studies which may contradict one another, or attempt to establish the quality of relevant studies. Rather, the references used are highly selective, only citing a small number of the available epidemiological studies and clinical trial reports, all of which are interpreted to support conclusions which are predetermined. End quote. Some have suggested that because the PhD was awarded through a humanities faculty, it would not be expected to, quote, present a detailed and systematic literature review or undertake primary research, end quote. Quote, we argue that a thesis which explicitly sets out to examine government vaccination policies, including an assertion on the underpinning scientific evidence and the stakeholders who have influence in the decision-making process, irrespective of the faculty or discipline in which it is conducted, should use methods for identifying and asserting scientific evidence of comparable rigor to those used by academic and scientific bodies which inform policy makers." End quote. This is Heidi Robertson from the Northern Rivers Vaccination Supporters. We are a group of concerned citizens dedicated to promoting good science and common sense in our region, the far north coast of New South Wales. This area, famous for its natural beauty and relaxed lifestyle, also has the lowest rates of vaccination in Australia. We are out to change that by challenging the myths and misinformation and by providing good evidence-based information to the community. We'd love for you, no matter where you are in the world, to join our fight. Please visit our webpage at www.nrvs.info. We also have a link there to our Facebook page. Tweet us at NRVAX supporters, that's V-A-X, and check us out on Wikipedia by searching for Northern Rivers vaccination supporters. Thank you. Well, hi, I am here in Canberra and I'm speaking with... Jose Barrero and Marina Trigueros. Nice to meet you all. Welcome to Canberra Skeptics. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you for having us here. Now, can we, uh, just for our audience, can you tell us a little bit about this yourselves? Mm. Well, I'm a um, uh, scientist of a Spanish background, as you can tell by my accent, that I've been working on the field of plant genetics for the last 15 years in a number of research organizations. And as we use GMOs regularly in our day-to-day -day work, we thought in starting an initiative to promote and explain why GMOs are useful to people and society. So myself, I'm a, I'm a former researcher in, in plant molecular biology, and I have moved to science communication, and I'm working as a science illustrator and 3D animator at Caribou Design. The reason you're here to talk today is because you're, you run GMO only. Can you tell us a little bit about GMO only? Hmm. Of course. Uh, this is a small initiative of three, of three partners, three scientists that working in plant genetics were exposed early 
tu genetic technology, biotechnology, genetic engineering, genetic modification, and we're aware of the benefits that this technology can bring to crops and agriculture, but also we're worried or concerned about the slow adoption of these techniques due to the mainstream concerns that exist in society. So we came with this initiative to talk very clearly about GMOs, explain things clearly to people, and yeah, just tell... I'm trying to promote the, the benefits that we have been seeing is, uh, as being researchers, we have seen all the, the benefits that GMOs can have and all the bad press that uh, he's been having and all the potential that it has. So we try to, to, to get to the general public and explain them what, what it is and why they can be used and why it can be good. Why do you think there is such opposition to GMO? I think there are a number of issues that we discussed, we will discuss today in the, during the talk, but in my opinion, I think there is a lot of misunderstandings and different topics brought together into the GMO debate that are not necessarily linked with the biotechnology itself. People mix things like this is only bringing benefit to big corporations, other people bring things, religious things like this is playing God, but to be honest, this is another technology that human has and is no different to the use of mobile phones or the use of other things. It's just a tool and it's how you use it to bring some benefits or negativities. And in your role as a science communicator, how have you used your skills to promote GMO? So I think our idea with the GMO only was making some impact uh, phrases, impact works trying to attract the people, making it more attractive the, the way of, like for example, with the, with the t-shirts, the way of starting a conversation. So you are wearing one of those t-shirts and the people is asking you and normally it's, mm, you are promoting the GMOs? That's, that's weird, why? So that's when you start the conversation and try to explain why, why we think they, they are good as a possibility. And what do you think the biggest misconception about GMO are? I think the biggest misconception is thinking that is playing God. I think it is because because since I, agriculture new. and farms have been existing, that the food that we are eating right now is totally different to let's call it natural way. We've been modifying in a different steps, and now we can do these kind of steps faster. Mm. But modification has been occurring because there's a lot of people in yeah, the world so we, we need to feed that's them. correct perhaps as marina said distinguishing differentiating this new way to create crops from the other way that people think is more natural like traditional breeding or domestication while both things will go to the same finish line and the human has been modifying them so it's and i think that's it yeah Okay, well, it looks like people are beginning to move in, so I think we'll wrap this up. So how can, we, how can people find you, and how can they find out more about GMO only? Well, the easiest way will be in Google, gmoonly.com. Yes. But also we are quite active in Twitter especially, so it's easy also to find our Yes, and in Facebook name. also, if you Google GMO only, you, you could find us over there. Okay, thank you very much. Aliens are probing people and mutilating cows. 9-11 was an inside job. Homeopathy cleared up my athlete's foot. Vaccines cause autism. Not all psychics are con artists. Mine is definitely real. We all have friends and family who believe these things and much more. Well, if you're a rational thinker who is tired of arguing on social media and never getting anywhere, we have a solution for you. Join the Guerrilla Skepticism and Wikipedia team and we will teach you how to add reliable scientific and skeptical information to the world's number one source of information, Wikipedia. We write new articles and improve existing ones. We remove pseudoscience, paranormal and old myth claims substituting the actual facts. And we operate in many languages. We've already reached tens of millions of people searching for information, but as you can imagine, we can never do enough. So please join us. All you need is a PC, a Facebook account, and the desire to help educate the planet. In fact, you'll be educating the world while you sleep. Contact us at gsowteam at gmail.com. Guerrilla Skepticism. 
The The time time is is now. now. Music by PurplePlanet.com Now, in the last week, the world saw action being taken against uh, climate change in the form of large protests by students all around the world. Uh, Sydney, Australia was no exception, but I notice also in, uh, in Europe and across the United States and other countries, students marching out of school to march uh, in support of action against climate change. And this prompts me to once again go to the website of Australian Skeptics, skeptics skeptics.com.au, to read the statement, a recent statement put out by the Australian Skeptics about climate change. Australian Skeptics, Inc. Statement on Climate Change. In 2010, Australian Skeptics, Inc. released a statement about the troubling use of the term skeptics, spelt with a K, or skeptics, spelt with a C, in the context of climate change. We now expand our position on so-called, quote, climate change skepticism, end quote. After more than 60 years of research, the agreement amongst scientists is that the climate is changing and that change is mostly human-induced. The agreement is as strong as that concerning evolution and the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Among experts, disagreement about the core elements is almost non-existent. Scientists have been cautious in their assessment of the evidence. Over time, most observations have turned out to be in the worst-case range of predictions, a far cry from the alarmism climate scientists are often accused of. It is not just scientists that treat climate change as real and a serious threat. Organizations around the world, from militaries to food manufacturers to insurance companies, are factoring the scientific predictions into their planning. From a practical perspective, we can, indeed we must, take climate change and its human cause as fact. Australian Skeptics Inc. views climate change skepticism as a form of denialism. Like creationism and anti-vaccination rhetoric, it ignores the experts in the relevant fields and engages in conspiratorial thinking. Australian Skeptic Inc. recognises anthropogenic climate change as a pressing global concern. We urge individuals, organisations and governments to prioritise limiting greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate their negative effects. And that is, which is very relevant at the moment, the Australian Skeptics, Inc. Statement on Climate Change. And you can read that for yourself at www.skeptics.com.au. Hi, Trish. Hi. Uh, Would you like a coffee? Yeah, thanks. What are you working on? I'm trying to come up with a new promo to play on the Skeptic Zone. Who's it for? Uh, The Good Thinking Society in the UK. You know the... uh... Oh, yeah, I know them. The guys who recently chased the homeopaths out of the UK public health system. Oh, did they? Yeah, they campaigned and lobbied government for a while, and now you cannot get homeopathy on the NHS. So they can now spend public money on healthcare that works. Ah, oh, right. Look, I'll mention that in the promo. Now, their website is goodthinkingsociety.org. And that website is a good resource for learning more about quackery. Ah, oh, thanks, Trish. That gives me something good to think about. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And as you would have heard earlier in the show, interviews from the 
Canberra sceptics and their meetups, their meetings. There's another one coming along on the 16th of April. So early notification for this. May the odds be ever in your favor. Superstitions and elite athletes. Elite sport has a healthy dose of uncertainty and the stakes are high. Athletes train hard to prepare mentally and physically to perform on the world stage. Learning to manage anxiety and get in the zone, ooh, maybe even in the skeptic zone, is one way that sports psychologists help athletes. Christine Dunn is a sports psychologist working in the Australian Capital Territory Academy of Sport. She has worked in the Australian and British elite sports systems with previous roles at the Scottish Institute of Sport and Australian Institute of Sport. Well, that looks like a fascinating talk. Again, if you head to www.canberraskeptics.org or look them up on Meetup. You can find out more about that meeting, that talk, coming up on the 16th of April. And thank you to those people, because I was up very late last night. I was up very late last night, uh, who went along to Maynard's Love Shack in Glebe, uh, just uh, on Saturday night in Australia. From the videos that were being streamed, it looked like a great success. Everybody was having a huge time. Wish I could have been there. Sorry I wasn't there, Maynard. Uh, And I hope you have something like that again. That was Maynard's Love Shack. But don't forget to check out Maynard's podcasts and other work at maynard.com.au. And I know I speak for Maynard when I say thank you to all those people who support his podcasts and The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. And you can do that with the skeptic zone anyway at skepticzone.tv without the people who do contribute who do subscribe uh, there would be no skeptic zone i hope to in the coming weeks once again visit the national center for science education in oakland and talk to more of the fascinating researchers and scientists who work there as well as looking forward to some more reports coming in from my various reporters scattered around the world Well, mostly in Australia. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the Bay Area, San Francisco. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. Doing his podcast. I am. Recognize this. He gets in podcast mode. I do. And to those people who listen after the music, yes, it's the dice game again. I'm here with the Bay Area Skeptics. Hi, guys. And it was what a thrill it was for me to give a talk here tonight in Berkeley about psychic detectives. Fantastic. Thank you. I I really enjoyed it. It was a nice crowd that came up, and I think they, they enjoyed it. So, anyway. We're going to do what we do occasionally on the Skeptic Zone. I've got a 10 sided die right here. Can you all agree? Yes? They're all examining it. Ten. That's a ten so, all, die. all those people who think I cheat, <laughs> I've got my referees here. Eugenie Scott, would you be, do the honors? Now, Eugenie's going to roll the die the first time. Folks at home, use your psychic predicting power. Will it be 1 to 10? Here we go. Eugenie's rolling the dice. And it's number 6. 6, six is the first number, folks. Bill. I knew it was going to be right. six. All right. Here we go. The next number is seven. So, so you're so smart. You I knew, knew it was going to be seven. You, you, Jay, you did the last one. <laughs> six, seven, and eight. eight. Six, seven, eight. Chance? eight. Providence. What? It's a straight. Yay! <laughs> oh, no, that's a different game. Are we playing <laughs> poker? We might you, be. You shake it. Six, seven, eight. Okay, one more special roll of the dice. Here we go. Oh. Four. Oh, there goes that. Oh, right. Everybody in the room gets right. a turn. Here we go. One more. 
One more folks at home. Five. One. One. So there goes that straight theory down the gurgle. We needed a five. We needed a five. <laughs> well, thank. We got all five right. Ooh, that's then that's um, six got times five right. That would be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got them. You knew, didn't you? Oh, I knew all the time. Come on, it's obvious. <laughs> what, what are what are we doing here? Yeah, it is, yeah. What, what, what is what is the point of all this? Oh, someone who doesn't listen to the bit after the music on the point. Oh, <laughs> okay, so the the game is I, I play with the audience. To use your predicting power and see if you can use your psychic power to predict what I'm going to roll with the die. And you've got a one in ten shot. And people play along. And uh, was it you were I telling won. me? Yeah. yeah. You I, got, I, I got them all right. He got in, them all right one week. Some yeah. show in, I think, the last one in January. Yeah. Yeah. He got, so it happened. Oh, great. Five? He, he, no, three. It was only three. three. Normally it's three only numbers. three. He got them all correct. Mm-hmm. Can you pick lottery I numbers for me? I don't think I can repeat it. So well, I, you don't need I'm to repeat sorry. that. You just have to repeat lottery, lottery numbers. Yeah. I've tried. I have not yet been successful. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the Darren Brown system, uh, the Darren Brown show, The System, where he tosses a coin ten times in a row and it comes up heads every time, and no. then he explains how he does it. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> he yeah. does it. Yeah, the two of <laughs> He does it, absolutely. No. No. Is it no. possible? Uh, sure. well, yeah. Of course it's possible. Yeah. Of course it is. is it inevitable? Yes. So how does he do it? The same way that you test psychic detectives. Perseverance. (laughs) He tosses for ten and a half hours and and only shows that part of the video. It's fantastic. It's like uh, tossing a basketball over uh, behind your head. Exactly. And and you just film film it and film it and film it. And you keep the one that works. What's the name of that? um, The mathematician from Stanford... Percy Diaconis. Okay. Yeah. yeah, he can flip. He can flip. Uh, you know, fifty well, coins demand. in a row because yeah. he's really good at flipping coins. He, is, <laughs> he has practiced for a long time. It's right. not like he's just taping the the right. hits. So you know, there are ways. This is why we have magicians, boys and girls. We have people who are very good at sleight of hand and very good at tricking you. And this is why, folks, if you live in the Bay Area, you should join the Bay Area Skeptics. Yay!